If you would, go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. It's the second shortest book in the whole Old Testament. And we're going to look at the last few verses today. We're going to close up the prophet Haggai's ministry. Chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. And we're going to look at the day of small things, which is a phrase Haggai never uses, but his friend and fellow prophet at the same exact time, Zechariah, uses that phrase over and over again, the day of small things, which is exactly how it felt to the people who had returned from exile. Remember, most of the Jewish people stayed in the Babylonian Empire. The few people that came back found a broken Jerusalem a destroyed temple, and yet they came back and did what Jesus told them to do, what God told them to do, even though it seemed insignificant at the time. So if you are able and willing, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word as we read these few verses aloud. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, Son of Sheltiel, declares the Lord, I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your words through the prophet Haggai. We ask you to meet us here in this place and speak to our hearts. Teach us and show us what you're inviting us into right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So, to really understand what's going on in this passage and also how it applies to us, there's something you have to understand in the background, and it's true for us too, and that is sometimes our simple obedience, that is doing the small things God tells us to do, seems futile. And it certainly would have seemed that way to the Israelites, who are now known as Jews, who had come back from the exile to Jerusalem, and there were very few of them that came back. And the temple had not yet been rebuilt. They had built the foundation 15 years earlier, and it just sat there. And now they're being told by Zechariah and Haggai to finish the job. And yet it seems like it's futile. I mean, it's not going to be as nice as the one before it, when they had from Solomon all of this this gold and beautiful things. This is going to be such a simple structure by comparison. And sometimes our obedience does seem futile. Sometimes it feels like we're just going through the motions and that nothing that we do matters. Nothing we do is going to last. No one's going to care a hundred years after we die. Have you ever felt that way? There you go. So does anyone remember, know the story of Sisyphus, the legend of Sisyphus? So Sisyphus was uh, a fictional uh, tyrant. He was a king in ancient Greece, uh, probably not a real person, um, but he was a brutal tyrant, and he, he did not show hospitality to strangers. He actually killed them to show off his own power. He was a bully. And so his punishment from the gods was in the afterlife, he had to roll a boulder up a hill every single day. And then, of course, it rolled right back down. He got up the next day, and the boulder was at the bottom, and he had to roll it up again. And he had to do that over and over and over for all eternity. Talk about futility. That's futility, isn't it? Imagine your only job is to roll a boulder up a hill only to get up the next day and do the same thing. It's like you're accomplishing nothing. And it's a picture of futility. But to some degree, all of us feel like our lives are a little bit on the futile side from time to time. From time to time, it feels like what we're doing is insignificant and meaningless. You know, I uh, have to prepare a sermon every single week. 
Uh, somebody's like, what's your week like? I'm like, I prepare a message. And they're like, every week? I'm like, pretty much every week. I mean, Sunday's always coming. No matter how many, I feel like the mailman, right? No matter how well you do at putting the mail out in mailboxes today, there's just more mail tomorrow and the next day. And the next same with my job and probably your job. Every single week I prepare another message. And after a while, no one remembers what you said. No one remembers. And you have to wonder how much difference does it make. Every week I have appointments for soul care. And I probably have four or five a week. And after a while they sort of run together and I'm like, does any of this really matter? Every week I have to do administrative tasks, like write a newsletter article. And you have to wonder, you know, besides making someone maybe smile once in a while, does it make any difference at all? And so every one of us has a job, and we do the sort of things that God tells us to do today, but it feels sometimes like it doesn't really matter if we did anything at all. A hundred years from now, who is really going to care? And that's probably how it felt to the Jewish people that were back in Jerusalem. Haggai and Zechariah say, finish the job, finish the temple. And the date of this is the second message. Uh, Tanner looked at the first message on that day um, last week. There's two messages delivered on this date, which was December the 18th, 520 B.C. This is the last time that we're going to hear anything from Haggai. December the 18th, 520 B.C. Within five years, they're going to finish this temple. It's a five-year built, roughly a five-year project. And we're never going to hear from him again. And the people who are building this temple are excited on one hand that they're going to restore the the Jewish religion to the way it's supposed to be. But there's a whole other issue that's never addressed in Haggai until now. And that is, yes, we're going to rebuild the temple. Yes, in a few years, we'll be making sacrifices at the temple just like our forefathers did. We're going to reinstitute Judaism the way it's always been. But what of the Davidic kingdom? You see, David had been promised that a descendant of his would always be on the throne in Jerusalem. But in 587, when the Babylonians before the Persians who are now in charge. When the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, they took the last king, Zedekiah, and they made him watch as they executed his sons. And then they poked his eyes out. And then they took him as a captive to Babylon. And he was the last descendant of David to ever be king. So now there was a guy named Zerubbabel, who was grandson of the king before Zedekiah, Jehoiakim, and he's just a governor. He has almost no power. And this is no longer the kingdom of Israel. This is just a tiny little meaningless province on the edges of the Persian Empire. And the people are probably wondering, okay, so we're going to rebuild our temple, but really what difference does it make? Has God abandoned us? These promises to David to have a king from his lineage always on the throne. There's not one now. Is there ever going to be? Or is all the stuff we're doing really meaningless? Has God abandoned his people? Have the promises been broken forever? That's still a question that everyone's asking. And finally here, in the last message of Haggai, he actually addresses that question. And he addresses it clearly. And here's what we learn in these verses. That though our obedience may seem insignificant to us and others, God promises to reward it no matter how small, as long as we are faithful. And he does so with Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel has just one task. The only task that we, are, we see that he has is lead the people in the rebuilding of the temple And he listens to Haggai, he listens to Zechariah, and he encourages the people to finish the job, and they do. And what we learn in verses 20 through 23 is as a result, God isn't finished with Zerubbabel or the people. And he is going to be faithful to them. Look at verse 21, the last part. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth which we've heard this before in the book of Haggai. But now listen to verse 22. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. 
So now God is referring to the last day, which as believers we now understand as the second coming of Jesus, which is still ways off, a way off. And God tells Zerubbabel and the people through Haggai, look, the day is coming when I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and I am going to shake the nations loose. And then the words he uses are interesting. He, he uses words like overthrow and destroy. He talks about brother taking down brother. That is the enemy taking down themselves. And he mentions uh, language like chariot riders. Now, verse 22 might not conjure up the images to you that it would have conjured up to the Israelites who first heard these words. But when they heard the word overthrow, they had a, and it's mentioned here twice, that word is used in the book of Genesis to describe what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. So when they hear that verb, their mind goes to the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then when they get to the word destroy, completely destroy, it's actually a word used in the book of in the first five books of the Bible, to describe the war on the people of Canaan and how God overthrew, literally destroyed, all the kingdoms who inhabited the land of Israel. And then when they saw chariots in their riders, they immediately think of the Exodus and the parting of the Red Sea. And how God closed the water on the army of Egypt, destroying horse and rider. And when they heard, brother will draw sword against brother, they would have thought about the story of the Midianites. And how with an army of only 300, Gideon defeated a much larger army of over 32,000. Because he didn't have to do a thing except blow trumpets. And the people of Midian got up and killed each other. So when they're hearing these words, these phrases, these verbs, these nouns, they're thinking about how God slaughtered their enemies in the past on four different occasions at least. And they're reminded God is not going to simply use them to destroy their enemies. God is going to destroy their enemies himself. He doesn't need their help. The day is coming When God will overthrow all of those who oppose his people. And that's not all. Look at verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shiltiel, declares the Lord. I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will make you like my signet ring. Now, a signet ring was a ring that kings wore either on their finger or around their neck. And the signet ring was actually their signature. So whenever they made a decision, they would press that into the wax to indicate that the king has agreed to this, therefore it is going to happen. New rule. The Persian kings used this. Other kings used this. This was a metaphor for authority and power. And God says, Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you like my signet ring. And we read that and we're like, okay, big whoop. Because we don't know the whole story. When they heard these words, you're going to be like my signet ring. Here's what they remembered. They remembered that God had actually cursed Zerubbabel's grandfather, Jehoiakim, And said through the prophet Jeremiah, I will pull you off. You are my signet ring and I will pull you off my finger and throw you away. So what what we are literally hearing in verse 23 is God has reversed the curse on Jehoiakim. The last king before Zedekiah by choosing his grandson Zerubbabel. So here's Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim takes over from the wicked Jehoiakim. He takes over in 598 or 597 B.C., and he gets to rule all of three months. And when he becomes king, the Babylonians have already surrounded Jerusalem and laid siege to it. So this could not be a worse time to become king. He takes over, and he only lasts three months. 
And those three months are dark months. And then finally, the Babylonians enter the gate, walk in, grab him, arrest him, and take him to Babylon, and he's never seen again. They depose him and make his uncle king in his place, who will later rebel and have his eyes poked out. But Jehoiakim was the king before Zedekiah. He only reigns three months, and then he's gone, although later he will be released from captivity. But here is what God said through the prophet Jeremiah to Jehoiakim. This is in the book of Jeremiah. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring, here's that word, even though if you were a signet ring on my right hand, my chosen one, I would still pull you off. I will deliver you into the hands of those who want to kill you, which is what happens. Those you fear, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Babylonians. I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born, and there you will both die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. None of your offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. These are God's last words to Jehoiakim. I will remove you as a signet ring. You will have no more authority, and none of your descendants will ever rule again. And yet, God had promised David that one of his descendants would always be king. And now here is Zerubbabel, grandson of Jehoiakim. He's not king of a mighty empire. He's governor of a small province on the western edge of the Persian Empire. Has God abandoned his people forever? That's the question the Jewish people are asking. And through the prophet Haggai, God says, Zerubbabel, you will be like my signet ring. What is he saying? Remember how I promised Jehoiakim I'm done with you? I've changed my mind. Now, can God change his mind? Well, he's God, okay? So God can do whatever he wants. He actually said to the prophets, if I claim that I am going to punish a kingdom and later that kingdom repents, I have the right to not punish them, but reward them. And if I tell another kingdom, I'm going to set them apart for myself and that they rebel against me, have the right to change my mind and punish them instead. In other words, I am God. I can do whatever I want and I can say one thing one day and I can change it the next day because I am God. So God says, even if you were my ring, Jehoiakim, I would pull you off and throw you away. And now he says to his grandson, new plan. You will be my signet ring. New plan. They thought God had abandoned his promises to David. And God says, I will honor Zerubbabel as he has honored me. And if you look at the language here, God uses the word servant in verse 23. My servant Zerubbabel. And then he says, for I have chosen you at the end of that sentence. Now, those are two small words. You're my servant whom I've chosen. But those are important words to Jewish people first hearing this passage because when God uses those words, they're words of election. God choosing people or kings. God used it of Israel. Listen to these words from Isaiah. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. Same words. You descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth. From its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. This is the language of adoption and election. And God uses these words to Zerubbabel. New plan. You're going to be like my ring. You're my servant. I've chosen you. These are the same words used of the greatest king, In all of Israel's history, David. From the Psalms, we we find these words. He, that is God, chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. The language used of the ideal king of Israel, David, is the same language used of Zerubbabel. God says, I have changed my mind. 
I told Jehoiakim, none of his descendants will ever rule. New plan. I've chosen you, Zerubbabel, to rule. Well, guess what? We never hear about Zerubbabel again. He disappears. He helped build the temple, and he dies. Maybe even before it's finished. We don't know. We never hear about him again. In all of history, we never hear from him again. So does he become king? No. Is, is the Davidic kingdom restored? No. So a lot of people read the, the, the prophet Haggai, these last four verses, and they go, huh, I guess Haggai was wrong. I guess God didn't actually choose Zerubbabel at all. The problem is, sometimes when God uses somebody by name, he's actually not referring to that person, but to a future descendant of that person. This is really important. Sometimes when God uses a name, it's just a metaphor. When God uses the word Elijah in the book of Malachi, it's a reference not to Elijah, but to Jesus. When he uses the word David in, one, in, in several cases, it's actually not a reference to David at all, but a reference to a descendant of David, the Messiah, whom we now know as Jesus. When he refers to Zerubbabel here as the signet ring, as the chosen servant, it's not a reference specifically to Zerubbabel, but one of his descendants. Let me give an example from King David. In the book of Ezekiel, this is during the exile, long after David has died and there are no more kings from his lineage. We find these words in the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. And he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So is David going to come back to life and rule the people? That's not how they read this. They read this as a descendant of David will become king. They understood this to be a messianic promise that one day a descendant of David will rule again in Jerusalem. One of the titles for Jesus in the New Testament is Son of David. That's a reference to this passage, the Messiah. When we hear that Zerubbabel is going to be like a signet ring, chosen as a servant of God, it's a reference to a future descendant of Zerubbabel. Here's the promise God made to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. That would be Solomon. And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne, speaking of David, will be established forever. God wasn't finished with David, although it looks like he was. And the people are wondering in the day of Haggai, is God done with us? Has he abandoned us? We're just a small province on the western end of the Persian Empire. We have no more king. We have no more glory. We have no more majesty. We have no more power. Is God finished with us? And Haggai says no. I am going to restore the kingdom of David to Zerubbabel. And then we find this in the New Testament. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, it says, This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Je and then it later says, Jeconiah was the father of Sheltiel. Sheltiel the father of Zerubbabel. In the book of Matthew, Zerubbabel is mentioned as an ancestor of Jesus. In Luke chapter 3, same thing. Jesus was the son, so it was thought, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Joannan, the son of Risa, the son of Zerubbabel. We find out in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke that Zerubbabel was an ancestor to Jesus. So did God keep his promise? He did. But it wasn't Zerubbabel, it was his later descendant, Jesus, who would be the king of all the earth. And when he comes again, he will be installed as king forever. There are two messages here. One is, I am going to do something great through you, Zerubbabel. I am going to raise up a Messiah. I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will judge the wicked and the dead. And I will install my king. The other part of this is, I will honor you because you have honored me. 
And I want to look at that part in just a moment. We're going to take a quick intermission. There are bathrooms out these doors, uh, drinks in the back, and we'll be back in three minutes to finish up. All right, if you would, go ahead and take your seats. So sometimes our simple obedience seems futile, meaningless, insignificant. But God promises to honor it just like he did with Zerubbabel. God honors our simple obedience. And with Zerubbabel, he was just a nobody. And yet God said, I'm going to make you like my signet ring. I'm going to restore the Davidic monarchy through you. Forget what I said to your grandfather. You have honored me. I will honor you. Here's what I want you to understand about this. The, the primary message of this is clearly about the Messiah. It's clearly about the kingship of Jesus. But there's a secondary, and I acknowledge there's a secondary message here that I think is really important. And that is that since our simple obedience will be rewarded by God, we should be faithful in the small stuff now. Because our simple obedience may be unseen to others. It may be meaningless to others. No one will probably remember you in 100 years because who's going to be left? Nobody who knew you personally. But here's the deal. God sees everything. And he rewards everyone who honors him eventually. I don't know when God's going to do it or how God's going to do it. I know this. If you are faithful, no matter how insignificant your obedience may seem, God will honor you. And the picture is a rubber bell. Listen to what one scholar said about Zerubbabel. This is so important. Follow along with me. He said this. In the world's eyes, Zerubbabel's life had little significance. I mean, honestly, outside the Bible, no one mentions him. He was a minor government official, a puppet governor, in a backwater province, the inheritor of a cast-off royal line. There are no more royalties in his family. Yet in spite of his lack of outward majesty, again, he was insignificant. God had chosen Zerubbabel and given him a significant task to undertake, that of rebuilding his house. That was his one job, and he did it. Zerubbabel had heeded the call of the prophet and led the people in the rebuilding program. That was what he did. That's all that God asked of him. His reward was to hear God say to him, in effect, words we hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. You did what I asked. Your reward is coming. Even in the day of small things, again, a reference to what Zechariah says about this same era. Even in the day of small things, obedience is not useless or unobserved. Someone's watching. Someone's watching. It may not yet be the day for shaking the world. That's still to come. But present small acts of faithfulness will receive their reward. God is paying attention to everything we do. And no matter how simple, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant our acts of obedience may be to us or others, God is taking note and he will reward us. Let me give you a more modern day story. Uh, let me tell you a little about Dr. Melvin Maxwell. I'm not sure if you guys follow leadership uh, books and authors and leaders or not, but one of the, the, the experts on leadership in our generation is a guy named John Maxwell. Um, he's older now. Uh, he's written a lot of books. He's given a lot of talks. He has been a regular speaker at the Global Leadership Summit. John Maxwell was a former pastor who decided to dedicate his life to developing better leaders. And I heard him speak multiple times at the Glo Global Leadership Summit, which is broadcast from Illinois, from Chicago area. Uh, back in 2016, I still remember this, he mentioned his dad in 2016 in a way I will never forget. Now, his dad died, as you can see here, in 2020. His dad died at 98 years old. And he still had a sharp mind all the way to his death, which is just amazing to me. Four years earlier, uh, in 2016, when John Maxwell gave this talk, 
His, his father was a young 94. And his wife had just died, John Maxwell's mom. And the siblings got together and said, you know, now that mom's not here, dad really needs to go to an assisted living facility. You guys ever had those conversations about family? So they talked to dad about it. Sometimes that conversation does not go well. And Dr. Melvin Maxwell said, you know what? You're right, I need to go to an assisted living facility. So they looked at some, and they found a villa, and he was willing to move there, and he was the first one to sign up as they were building it. So it wasn't complete yet, but he managed to convince the people building it he would get the very first room. So he told his son, John Maxwell, son, I am going to be the first one there because that's important to me. And John Maxwell said, Dad, why is it so important that you're first? And he goes, well, son, a lot of old people are going to move here, you know. And John Maxwell's like, uh, yeah, Dad, I know that. He said, well, they're going to be nervous because a lot of them have never been away from their families before. And this is what he said. He said, I want to be at the front door and shake their hand and say, my name is Melvin Maxwell, and I live here, and you're going to like it here, and we're going to be friends. Isn't that just sweet? So at 94 years old, Melvin Maxwell said, I want to be first, and I want to make these old people feel loved because God has called me to love others and I want to do it as long as I can. And he did that until he could no longer do that. I am inspired by Melvin Maxwell. And I think about how this 94-year-old man said, God's not finished with me yet. If you're 94 and you're moving into an assisted living facility, I think it's okay to be a little selfish and say, this is my time. I don't have much time left. But I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to have some really cool flower pots on my back patio, and I'm going to watch my favorite program. I'm going to do my thing. Melvin Maxwell said, I do not exist for myself alone, but for the sake of others, and as long as I can, I will love others well. It's not about me. Man, I hope I'm like that. Are you like that? Think about this. Do you have the heart of Melvin Maxwell, or do you think first about your own stuff. I'm going to have a conversation here that's going to be for Oasisites only. So if you have been here for less than 30 or 60 or even 90 days, okay, if you've been here for less than 90 days, just you're eavesdropping, okay? You can, you can plug your ears. This is not for you. You can go la, 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 la. This is for those of us who belong to Oasis. In the back, there are two um, thingies. I don't know what they are. Like that. Is there even some little lights around it, okay? That's the Say Yes campaign. Let me explain that. Every one of those pieces of paper back there stands for an actual volunteer position at Oasis that's empty, meaning we actually have a need. If we have teams that don't have a need, we don't have a card back there. Those cards represent actual holes that people have not filled. Now, I am a firm believer that God provides everything a church needs because he is good. So if there are holes, that probably means there is somebody God's inviting to serve who's doing this. La da 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 I don't know who those people are, but I know where they are. Here! Right? Here. So, I want to invite you to be like Melvin Maxwell. And I want you to ask the question, Jesus, where would you have me serve? Some people are home church leaders. That's amazing. Some people are directors. That's a group of people that oversee me, and I need it. There are other people that are on the worship team, other people that are helping out with kids right now at this very moment. There are people that show up here at 730 to help set up. There are people that help break down. There are people that put signs out. There are people that work with youth. There are all kinds of people who serve. And then there are some people who don't do anything. I don't know what God's inviting you to do, but I bet, I bet he's inviting you to do something. And no matter how seemingly small or insignificant it may be, God is watching. And he will reward even the most insignificant task if done in obedience to him. Now, I don't know what God's inviting you into. I don't pretend to have a crystal ball. I don't know what God's inviting you into. I really don't. 
but it's probably not to simply bask in the hard work of others, right? If God has called you to serve him, he's inviting you to serve him somewhere. Sydney's our volunteer coordinator, and she would love it if people would go back there, look at that stuff, and grab one of those and say, I'm called to do this. And if you go back there and you read all of those and you're like, none of these are for me, then go to Sydney and say, you know what? None of those are for me. Here's what I would like to do. Can you make a new position for me? And I bet you she will. No matter what you do, God is watching. And I would love to have a church full of Melvin Maxwells who say, even at 94, it's not about me. I just want God to use me to love others well as long as I have the breath of life in my lungs. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would raise up people like Melvin Maxwell at Oasis. People who live to serve others, who realize our joy is found not in taking care of our needs, but in laying down our lives for those around us. Father, I don't know what you've called us into, but I know you've called us to do something, to serve in some capacity. And I pray that you would lay on the heart of all of those who belong to Oasis one place where they can serve and bring you honor and bring you glory. Father, set us apart and use us because we know that you honor the smallest, most simple acts of obedience and faithfulness done in your name. Thank you so much for choosing us and for choosing to use us because you could do everything you need to do without us. But you invite us to be a part of your program of bringing about your kingdom on this planet. And we thank you for that. And we pray that you would speak clearly to each of us today. And we pray this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus.